This is Faulkner. It turns out he is the worst gym leader in the entire history of the Pokemon series. Now that may sound like a bold, unsupported statement, but today I'm going to show you how me and my team used AI to rank every single trainer in Pokemon. Right now you're seeing a program simulate over 1 million Pokemon battles. From Red versus Cynthia to Brock versus Leon, every possible matchup is being played out 100 times. The program pits two heuristic-based AI bots against each other, which basically means they're coded to follow a set of predefined rules. Each battle has been documented, and we're now going to analyze the results to scientifically determine the best and worst trainers. I'm also giving away a copy of Scarlet and Violet to one of you. All you have to do is subscribe, watch the end, and comment what the most surprising placement was. To begin, we're going to look at the nine worst trainers in the series, who, as you might expect, are all first gym leaders in their respective game. The ninth worst trainer is Rock Trainer Brock of Red and Blue. Of 15,000 fights, Brock was able to win just a thousand, with his most impressive performance being a flawless 100 to nothing win rate against both Lieutenant Surge and Elisa of Black and White. Considering power scaling and that he's the first first gym leader ever, Brock has held up pretty well. Now Roxanne from Pokemon Emerald performed only slightly worse with 948 wins, coming in at the 8th lowest. The 7th worst trainer was Cress, the Gym 1 water variant of Black and White, followed by Sillin, the grass-based variant. At the 5th lowest spot, we had Bug User Katie of Scarlet and Violet, followed by Black and White's weakest Gym 1 variant. Chili. In Black and White 2, Charon replaces those three leaders and he is our third weakest leader. And lastly, Bug User Viola of Pokemon X and Y is the second weakest at spot number 149. Now to give you an idea of just how bad Faulkner is at his bottom placement of 150, consider that the second worst trainer Viola still had 214 wins. Faulkner, in dead last, was only able to secure five in the entire tournament, all coming from Viola. Faulkner's team of a level seven and nine were just so comparatively weak that he couldn't get a single win over most gyms he had a type advantage over. Faulkner, Viola, Charon, Chili, Katie, Sillin, Cress, Roxanne, and Brock make up our first and lowest tier of trainers. Trainers are being grouped based on their performance to help keep things organized. Each tier roughly corresponds to the average gym of its respective level. As we move on to our second tier, this means characters ranking here perform close to the average Gym 2 leader. Now, at the bottom of this group, at 141, is Pokemon Crystal's Bugsy, the worst performing Gym 2 leader. So far, Generation 2 is off to a very bad start. Now, Generation 7 had Grand Trials instead of Gym Leaders, and Hala's team looks like a normal game's Gym 2. We see this check out as he places next at spot 140. Then, at 139, we have Rourke of Pokemon Platinum's first gym. Despite only being level 14, Rourke was able to win more than two second gym leaders. For Rourke to place in tier 2, this just means that despite being the first leader in his game, he's actually more on par with the average second gym leader. Next up, we have Brassius of Gen 9, followed by Brawly of Emerald, and then Roxy of Black and White 2. Next, placement 135 is our first huge upset, being taken by Pokemon Crystal's fourth gym leader, Morty. Considering he has a level 25 Gengar, Morty is only ranking higher than someone with a level 18 Ace. Now if we look into the data, we can actually start to see Morty's problem. If you look at the fights, he simply had an inability to damage normal types. Look at someone like Charon from Black and White 2. Despite being 10 levels lower, both of his Pokemon could set up using Work Up, then use Bite, while Morty really couldn't do much to retaliate. Now next up is Milo of Sword and Shield, who placed as the highest ranking first gym leader. Now, Milo wasn't particularly exceptional. His level just happens to cap much higher than the other first gym leaders at level 20. Lenora will then take spot 133, and at 132, Misty of Red and Blue will be our last tier two leader. Impressively, Misty is the third highest ranking Gym 2 leader, which again shows less power creep through the series than one might expect. But as we move to Tier 3, I might want to take that back. 
as our very next leader after Misty is actually Lieutenant Surge. As the first member of Tier 3, Surge did well for the most part. His problem was being set back by the many early game rock leaders who he couldn't damage. Brock, Roxanne, and Rourke all have dual ground types, and he lost every single fight to all three of them. So despite doing good everywhere else, these 300 losses really hurt his placement. Interestingly though, Electric Leader Watson of Pokemon Emerald comes next, with only a slightly better performance. At 129, we have Platinum's second leader Gardenia, who performed very well with a fully evolved Roserade. After her is Grant of X and Y, followed by the notorious Whitney of Gen 2. Now considering at this point that nearly all trainers are around Whitney have three Pokemon level 23 to 25, her team of two, led by a level 20 mil tank, shows a really stellar performance. I also have to point out the fact that she placed higher than her five level senior Morty. Next is Berg of Black and White, followed by Nessa of Sword and Shield, and then Elisa, who is Black and White's following gym leader. Seeing as she barely came out over Berg, we can really start to see that it's consistency which makes for a good placement. So far, all the electric leaders are underperforming simply because they don't have the coverage to deal with ground types. Now, Kabu of Sword and Shield ranks 123, barely besting Nessa, and then Olivia of Sun and Moon, that's the second grand trial which roughly correlates to about a fourth gym, will finish out tier 3. Now moving on to tier 4, this is where you're going to start to see things get really skewed. Tier 4 is meant to represent the average fourth gym leader, but it has leaders from the third, fifth, sixth, and even seventh gym of its respective game in it. Starting this tier at placement 121, we have Scarlet and Violet's fourth gym leader, Kofu. What's so fascinating about this placement is right after him at 120 is Iono, Scarlet and Violet's third gym leader who caps a whole six levels lower. Now after previous performances, I was really surprised to see an electric leader do so well here. Once you look at her team though, it becomes really obvious why. Iona has a Watro with a flying move, a Belly Bull with Water Gun, a Luxio with Bite, and that absolutely deadly Miss Magius. This is the fourth mid-20 electric gym leader we've looked at. Iono is the outlier, and she was able to perform so well because of great coverage and team diversity. Another interesting oddity of Tier 4 is the very next trainer is Fantina of Platinum. She ranks the exact same and has a very similarly leveled Miss Magius. Now next up is Fire user Flannery of Pokemon Emerald, and then at 100 117, we have what is technically the biggest upset of the tournament. So Price is technically the seventh gym leader of Pokemon Crystal. But because the game is non-linear, he actually scales to equal a gym 5 Johto leader. So it is still a bad performance, but maybe not as bad as on first glance. Erika of Kanto is next at 116, and just besting his gym 5 equal is Gen 2's fighting leader, Chuck. Next at 114, we have Norman of Pokemon Emerald, who is surprisingly ranking quite low. Norman has great power, and I would have thought his slacking would have had him batting pretty high above his weight class. Turns out its true ability was able to hold it back, and that, combined with a horrible ghost matchup, places him here. Continuing the oddities of tier 4, next up is X and Y's fourth leader Ramos. Why this placement is weird is it's followed by X and Y's third leader, Corona. Corona's whole team has access to power up punch, and this allowed her a huge advantage in most fights. Next up is ground user Clay of Black and White. I always found his Excadrill to be quite scary, but he's really only ranking slightly above average. More interestingly though, is right after him is Black and White's sixth leader, Skyla. So it's hard to say whether Clay did good or the other Black and White leaders are just underperforming. One region that's performing well above average is Sinnoh, as topping out tier 4 is going to be Maylene of Pokemon Platinum. Heading into tier 5 is Koga, who despite having a level 43 ace, is ranking only just above trainers that are 10 levels lower. And take note that because he's an Elite 4 member in Pokemon Crystal, he'll appear again with that team. 107 is Jasmine of Johto, followed by Winona from Hoenn. And if we don't count Price from Crystal, Bryson would then get the title of lowest ranking Gym 7 leader. From here, we have Gym 5 Larry of Scarlet and Violet, followed by Clement of X and Y. And finally, finishing off the last Gym leader in Pokemon Crystal is Claire. With a decent team of 3 Dragonairs, and a level 40 Kingdra, I was actually expecting a better performance. But if there's one thing I've learned from this project so far, it's that Johto sucks and I was justified in trying to fix it with my ROM hack. Now next, topping Eau Claire is Sword's 
fourth gym leader B, followed by Platinum's fifth gym, Crasher Wake. And surprisingly, Claire is not the only underperforming dragon leader, as next is Iris from Pokemon White. Pokemon Black has almost the exact same team for this fight, but Drayden actually has a different ability, and it turns out this made a difference. Because after Iris is Alistair of Pokemon Shield, and then Drayden, who had 138 more wins than Iris. Moving into tier 6, we start with Wallace's gym leader team from Ruby and Sapphire. We always use the Emerald or third version team, as it's the most complete, but Wallace is a niche case with a different role between the versions. Nanu from Sun and Moon places next, followed by Valerie of X and Y, and then Sabrina. Notably, Valerie and Sabrina were near perfect matchups, with Sabrina winning their 100 fights only 51 to 49. Opal from Sword and Shield is next, followed by Blaine from Red and Blue, and then Byron from Platinum. From here, it's Giovanni who had a very interesting upset. We previously saw Ghost Leader Morty being a big underperformer. He had one big redemption, however, which came from pummeling Giovanni 100 to nothing. Despite the Rocket Gym Leader having a whole 25 levels over him, his only two damaging moves were Poison Sting and Doug Trio's Dig. Morty won using a combination of Curse, Hypnosis, and Nightshade, while Giovanni could do nothing back. From here, Tier 6 is next going to see Crystal's Elite 4 members Will and Koga, who are the two lowest ranking Elite 4 members in the tournament. We'll then finish up this tier with Gordy, the sixth gym leader in Pokemon Sword. Now, tier 7 begins with Tate and Liza of Emerald, who did better than Wallace's Gym. 8 Ruby Saf team. Despite being crafted for double battles, their individual members were strong enough to keep them effective in a single battle tournament. Next is Scarlet Violet's Rhyme, followed by Crystal's Bluno, then Melanie, Olympia, Candice, and Agatha at spot 79. Agatha gets to take the title of lowest ranking Elite Four member who is not from Johto. And the reason behind that is Agatha's only good Pokemon are Gengar, and there were no strong ghost moves in Gen 1, so she didn't really have any sources of power. Now right after her is Sydney from Emerald, to take the spot of second worst non-Johto E4, we'll then finish out tier 7 with Volkner of Platinum, followed by Piers from Sword and Shield. Now take note, we still have the tiers for Elite 4, Champion, and Final Postgame bosses to cover, along with ranking the regions. The last tier is going to rank trainers like Red from Crystal, Steven and Emerald, and Cynthia's rematch team, so make sure you don't miss that. Starting out tier 8, we have a well-performing one from Pokemon Emerald. Things are seemingly normal with Grusha, the final gym leader from Scarlet and Violet next. Also fitting nicely is Hapu, Sun and Moon's final grand trial. This trend sadly won't continue, however, as next is Emerald's second Elite Four member, Phoebe. Fear not, Phoebe, for even more embarrassing than your performance is our 71st spot going to Karen, the lowest ranking fourth E4 member. Fear not, Karen, for even more embarrassing than your performance is our 70th spot going to Crystal's champion, Lance. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Lance is our lowest ranking champion in the series. Not only that, but he even did worse than his Elite Four team from the previous games. Now from here we've got Tulip from Scarlet and Violet, followed by Black and White Elite Four members Caitlyn, Marshall, and Grimsley. This was really cool to see because with the exact same level Pokemon, these placements show some real consistency with the AI. Now next, Bruno's Red Blue team will take spot 65, followed by Lorelei at 64. From here it's Glacier from Emerald, followed by Notorious Leader Rayhan from Sword and Shield. Now the Elite Four tier is going to be one large group, rather than being split into four separate sections. This tier is composed mostly of high-performing E4 members, but it also has two exceptionally strong gym leaders and one underperforming champion. At the very bottom, we start with Marnie from the first round of Sword and Shield's Champion Cup. Right after that is Lance's E4 team of Generation 1. Then it's Hop's Rillaboom-led team from the Champion Cup. At 58, it's Black and White's highest-performing Elite 4 member, Chantal. Crazily though, at number 57, we have Black and White 2's 8th gym leader Marlin. Despite only having 3 Pokemon averaging level 50, this dude went against all odds and managed to outperform 18 Elite 4 members. And yes, that is his normal mode team. Now slightly less impressive, but still worth noting, is Wolfric of X and Y. He's actually the highest ranking gym leaders in the series. I say it's less impressive though, because his team caps at level 59. It's still a great performance, but given Marlin's lower level cap, his ranking is more impressive. Now from here at 55, we've got Hop Cinderace team, followed by Bede's Champion Cup team. B of the Champion Cup is next, 
next, followed by Hops and Teleon team, then Aaron of Platinum's Elite Four, and topping out 50 is Nessa. At 49, we have Rayhan again, followed by Bertha from Platinum. Rika will be the first Elite Four member from Scarlet and Violet to appear, followed by Platinum's third Elite Four member, Flint. 45 is Enz Reshiram team, followed immediately after by Zekrom. Lucian of Platinum is next, followed by Hala's E4 team, and then it's Drake of Emerald. And I think we should note that Drake did massively better than the rest of Emerald's E4. With three Pokemon four times weak to ice, he's easy to beat as a player, but because many teams don't have ice to stop him, his heavy hitters were often left unchecked. At 40, we have Alistair, who is the highest performing champion cup team from Sword and Shield. 39 is Acerola, and 37 is Olivia, who is the highest ranking member before the champion tier. But backtracking to 38, we have the series' second lowest ranking champion, and that is Trace from Let's Go. So I'm willing to let Lance's horrible champion performance off the hook since his team level average is only 47. Trace, on the other hand, deserves no sympathy. This guy has a team of six Pokemon averaging 56 and he doesn't even have the time to give his Pokemon four moves. I hate Trace. Trace is an embarrassment. I am mad he even gets associated with the likes of Blue, and in my eyes, I give him title of worst champion. Now moving into the champion tier, Getsus marks the end of Black and White's main game, so he acts more as the game's champion. And despite him only capping at 54, I'm glad to see him just make it into this tier. Drasna, on the other hand, from X and Y is awful. Drasna caps 11 levels higher than Getsus and only manages to rank one spot higher. Now, while Wallace's Emerald Champion team is up next, and very interestingly, this was the only instance where a trainer had a perfect tie. Wallace went 50 wins to 50 losses against Sun and Moon's Kahili. Then Wickstrom of X and Y also performed given his level 65 cap. Now our next spot is Champion Steven Stone of Ruby and Sapphire, and I for one am very happy to see him beat Wallace. I'm a Steven supremacist, so I'm glad that we can now finally back up the claim that he's a better champion than Wallace. Really neat though, Mulane of Ultra Sun and Moon is the only other trainer to have a Metagross, and he actually ranks right after Steven. Now at 29, we have our first appearance of Blue with his Venusaur team. Champion Iris is next, followed by fan favorites Elite Four Larry. Malva of X and Y places at 26, Blue's Blastoid-led team is 25, Scarlet and Violet's Hassel ranks 25, and Blue's Charizard team will edge out the other two to take 20. Three. And this will not be the only time that the Firestarter team does this. At 22, we have X and Y's highest ranked E4 member, Cybolt. And despite my absolute hatred for her, Gita then ranks pretty modestly at 21. Ironman's final team actually beats her out though at spot 20. But what makes me even more happy is Poppy. Paldea's third Elite Four member and Gita's underling actually outperformed her, taking the 19th. Spot. This was the only instance in the entire tournament where a champion was beat by their own Elite Four member. That goes to show just how bad Gita is, and more importantly, it scientifically proves that she is undeserving of champion. Fucking hate Gita. All my homies hate Gita. Now, next up is Platinum Cynthia's champion team. While this isn't the last Cynthia team we'll look at, there were only two champions that bested her, and both had pretty significant level gaps on her. Penny of Scarlet and Violet was next, and then Peony of Sword and Shield ranked at 15. But we see champion Lee. Leon's Rillaboom team ranks 16, his Inteleon team at 14, and his Cinderace team at 12. Leon is higher level than Cynthia and is known for being a very strong champion, so this kind of checks out. And the only other champion that ranked above Cynthia was actually Diantha, which is just not fair. Diantha ranks high because she's the highest level champion. It's not because her team is particularly built, because we even see Leon's Cinderace team rank higher than it, as the, actually the highest ranking champion. And that actually means we only have the post-game boss tier to cover. Before we reach the strongest of the strong, I wanted to first examine the fascinating performances of the regions as wholes. As you probably expected, given Johto's low level, it was the worst performing region by a landslide. Even when considering levels, their horrible team composition had them ranking consistently worse than trainers of a similar level and team size. Johto is 
garbage. Of 152 trainers, Jodo's average placement was 100. And the only trainer to perform above his weight class was Red. Now, Red isn't even technically from Jodo, so if you take out his massive contribution, the average Jodo trainer ranking goes down to spot 107. Now, the second lowest ranking region was Kanto, with an average placement of 87. Considering their limited move pools and lack of a final post-game boss, this is a modest ranking for the first region in the series. And then the third worst was surprisingly Unova. Despite having well-constructed teams, this region just suffered from a fairly low average level. We even accounted for the multiple first leaders of this region so as to not have it skew the weight, and despite that, the average Gen 5 trainer placement was 80. Four. Now next up was Gen 3 Hoenn, followed by Gen 4 Sinnoh, and then Gen 6 is Kalos. What's really funny to note about Gen 6 is they actually had the highest average level trainer. And with that, if you were to factor in levels, Kalos would actually be the second worst performing region. Now with a ton of late game major trainers like Arvin and Penny, Gen 9's Paldea understandably ranked well, taking the number 3 spot. Now technically, under our ranking, it was the Alola region that ranked as the highest average player. Placement, but this isn't the full picture. Alola doesn't have eight gyms and instead only has four grand trials. And this combined with a strong elite four actually skews the region too high. It's not that Alola has the strongest trainers, it's just that they have the least weak. And once you factor that, they actually don't take number one. No, see, there's one region that is even better. Home to both Hop, Leon, and the series' longest reigning champion, it is no wonder that the strongest region is Gen 8's Galar. Now, finally, ladies and gentlemen, it's time we move on to the final tier of our list, the post-game bosses. At number 11, we have Nimona's final Meow Scarada team from Scarlet and Violet. At number 10, we have Alder, who, despite being the champion of Black and White, serves as the game's post-game boss to the Elite Four rematch. Next, placing at number 9 is both Nimona's Quackavel team and her Skeledurge team. Despite Skeledurge slightly beating it out, since they ranked next to each other, we decided to just lump them together. And similarly, at number 8, we have Kukui's Decidueye team, ever slightly bested by his Incineroar team. Yeah, plot twist, Professor Kukui is actually the series' strongest champion. At number 7, we have a stellar performance from Hoenn's own Steven Stone. And then at number 6, it's Kukui's best performing team with the Primarina starter. Now at number 5, we have Hop's post-game fight where he has a Zamazenta, and this is the final repeating trainer. The repeats were important but kind of annoying, and so to give you a true ranking of just the pure top 10 trainers with no repeats, we're gonna backtrack and just and just give you the straight top 10 list, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, finally I give you the scientifically ranked top 10 trainers in the Pokemon series. Number 10, Diantha, Champion of Kalos. Number 9, Leon, Champion of Galar. Number 8, Alder, Champion of Unova. Number 7, Nimona, Rival of Paldea. Number 6, Professor Kukui, Champion of Alola. Number 5, Steven Stone, Former Champion and Collector of Rare Rocks. Number 4, Pokemon Trainer Red. Number 3, Hop, Rival of Galar. Number 2, Cynthia, Champion of Sinnoh. And finally, number one is Dojo Master and former champion of Galar, Mustard. So as a fanboy, I must admit, I'm very happy to see Steven's post-game fight make the top five. I'm disappointed with Red, and he could have been number three, but in this tier of absolute titans, Red's non-factor Pikachu basically puts him fighting with five Pokemon. Hop was able to make huge ground against Red with his sixth member being a Zacian. Now, as for Cynthia, it turns out that despite having the biggest reputation and three levels over him, Mustard of the Galar region is the strongest trainer. And honestly, it feels really fitting that the champion who reigned the longest would be the strongest in the series. It's mentioned that Mustard's closest partner Pokemon died many years ago, so it's crazy to think that this even isn't Mustard at his strongest. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you want to enter the Scarlet and Violet giveaway, just comment what the most surprising placement was, and please don't forget to subscribe.